Hi everyone, it's the bonus episode. This is the first bonus episode, so I'm making it free. Every subsequent bonus episode is going to be unlisted, with the link available on the Patreon page. So you'll need to give me a dollar to watch it, or find someone who gave me a dollar and ask for the link from them. The Patreon's down there in the description. These bonus episodes are going to be about specific events in history which affected urban development or which had a major impact on the built environment or at least which occurred in cities. Oh, and I guess for this episode I should do a CW. That's a content warning. We got murder, mob violence, racism, the Klan... Uh, some bad policing, uh, there's rape, kind of. There's a lot of bad stuff going on. So we're going to Tulsa, Oklahoma in this episode. Now Tulsa is one of those cities I'm sure the coastal elites don't really think about that much. It's got one of the nation's best collections of art deco architecture though. It also has the bizarre Googie style campus of Oral Roberts University. And it's got the tallest building in the United States outside of a downtown. In 1921, it was also the site of the nation's wealthiest black neighborhood, uh, Greenwood, or as it was sometimes known, Black Wall Street. It was destroyed in what is usually called a race riot, but what was really an organized assault and massacre perpetrated by a racist mob led by the Ku Klux Klan. So this episode is largely focused around race and racial conflicts. It's also going to be fairly light on visuals compared to my other videos. Uh, City Skylines is of limited use as a visualization tool for events like this. So it's going to be a lot of me talking and some pictures and then there are some cinematics in the middle. This uh, isn't really a City Skylines channel after all. It's it's a channel about cities which happens to use City Skylines as its primary visualization tool. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, this usually is not so serious of a channel, right? But the uh, events we're about to go over were extremely violent and deeply traumatic for a lot of people. And it was all but expunged from the history books for 90 years. So I can't do too many jokes here. Uh, sorry to everyone who wants jokes. Okay, so in 1906, a guy named O.W. Gurley moved to Tulsa and bought a big parcel of land bounded by Pine Street, Lansing Avenue, Cincinnati Avenue, and the St. Louis-San Francisco Railroad tracks. That's uh, also known as the Frisco Railroad. It never actually made it to San Francisco, though. His intention was to divide the land up and sell it only to other African Americans. Now, this worked remarkably well in this community called Greenwood, became a bustling little uh, neighborhood, and fairly quickly became known around the country as Black Wall Street. Now, how did this happen? Uh, there's this thing which is kind of the converse of gentrification that Jane Jacobs called unslumming, which is when a neighborhood becomes wealthier by means of its residents becoming wealthier, as opposed to gentrification, which happens when new wealthier people move in, uh, displacing the people who already live there. So she described this in terms of Boston's North End, which was, at the time she wrote, the death and life of great American cities, slated for eventual demolition and urban renewal. Uh, the community had revitalized itself from an overcrowded immigrant slum into a vibrant and beautiful neighborhood, largely without government intervention or urban renewal. But despite being denied access to capital by Federal Housing Administration blacklisting, Folks in the neighborhood got renovations and improvements done by a combination of a sort of barter system and capital investment by neighborhood banks. Money that went into the neighborhood stayed in the neighborhood, and folks just got wealthier staying in place. So what, what do I mean by money stayed in the neighborhood? Uh, imagine you got five bucks. You spend it on, say, a big hoagie from the deli across the street. Now that money goes to paying employees, paying for the hoagie ingredients, 
and some profit for the deli owner. So some of your money stays in the neighborhood. Uh, that goes to the employees and the owner, while some of that money leaves the neighborhood and goes to Dietz and Watson and Amorosos, who have, of course, now moved to New Jersey because they're cowards. Those employees or the owner may spend the money in other stores in the neighborhood, or they might buy stuff from Amazon and the money disappears into some untaxed hole. Uh, now compare that to, say, buying the same hoagie from Wawa. The profit goes to the Wawa headquarters in Wawa, Pennsylvania, rather than staying in your neighborhood. Or if you spent that five bucks on my Patreon, which is in the description, that money would also leave your neighborhood entirely, and it would go to me, who uh, has to give it to my landlord, who will spend it on whatever it is landlords spend money on. So what I'm getting at here is that a single dollar can have a disproportionate economic impact in an area if it can be recirculated in that area many times. So how did this work in Greenwood? Uh, if you were buying land from O.W. Gurley in 1906, of course, you probably weren't that bad off to begin with, so that, that's a factor. And another big factor was segregation. Uh, most businesses in downtown Tulsa did not cater to blacks at all. This meant that, you know, African Americans could only do their shopping in Greenwood. Greenwood shopkeepers could only buy goods from other Greenwood shopkeepers and wholesalers. Plenty of African Americans had jobs outside the neighborhood, but all their errands and shopping had to be done in Greenwood. Uh, the effect of this was to turn Greenwood into a money sink. A dollar spent in Greenwood would stay in Greenwood for up to a year and be spent about 19 times, which was an anomaly for the time and almost unheard of today, where the average length of time a dollar spends in majority African American communities uh, is six hours. Uh, and also, since the neighborhood was primarily homeowners, there were no landlords to suck wealth out of the community. Those landlords that did exist also lived and shopped in Greenwood, so the money stayed around Greenwood. Uh, the effect of this was to make Greenwood residents very wealthy, and uh, when I say very wealthy, you know, that's like airplane wealthy. Six Greenwood families owned private planes. It's 1921, so private planes were a little cheaper and not, you know, not as good as today, but they had them. The houses were big, everyone had these newfangled automobiles. Uh, life was pretty good, apart from, you know, the discrimination you faced anywhere outside of the neighborhood. I just, I'm not trying to, like, advertise for segregation as a means of revitalizing African American communities here. I'm just, you know, this was just how it sort of worked out for the neighborhood. Uh, so what I've tried to do here is reconstruct Greenwood in 1921 uh, in city skylines based on some aerial photography from the 1960s and some historic photographs. I had to take some artistic license to account for the limitations of the game and, you know, the lack of detailed contemporary maps that I could find. Uh, we'll start with this reference point. This is Greenwood Avenue on Archer Street facing north. You can see the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas railroad tracks crossing at an angle here. The uh, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe railroad tracks are at the right, heading north-south, and the Frisco tracks are to the south, heading east-west. Uh, this block today contains the 1 OK field, which we'll talk about later. Uh, an inner urban line, the Sandy Springs Railroad, provides a direct link to downtown Tulsa and the city of Sandy Springs, which is west of Tulsa. It also provides freight and package service for local businesses. Uh, short freight trains would run directly down the street on the streetcar tracks to uh, deliver stuff instead of, you know, the UPS guy or whatever we'd have today. Businesses were primarily clustered around Archer Street and Greenwood Avenue, and to the north was mostly single-family housing. There was some light industry served by the railroads in the area, but overall, Greenwood was a mid-to-upscale shopping district. So uh, let's start the timeline of Greenwood's downfall. May 30th, 1921, Memorial Day. Now, Dick Rowland was a 19-year-old shoe shiner working in downtown Tulsa and who lived in Greenwood. 
he was allowed to use the restroom on the top floor of the Drexel building located at 319 South Main Street. This building no longer exists, but here is a street view of where it was. Here's a picture of what it looked like back in the day. So to get to the restroom, Roland had to take an elevator, which was operated by 17-year-old Sarah Page. Uh, now at some point during the day, he did so. He went to use the restroom. On his return, a clerk in the shop on the first floor, uh, Renberg's, heard a woman scream and witnessed a young black man rushing from the building. So no one's exactly certain what happened on that day, and we lost uh, Sarah Page's statement to the police, but the general consensus is that Dick Rowland lost his footing in the elevator and steadied himself on the first thing he can grab, which happened to be Sarah Page. The clerk, however, assumed the worst, that Dick Rowland had raped or otherwise assaulted Sarah Page on the three-story elevator trip and reported the incident to the authorities. Uh, the police pretty quickly determined that nothing had happened and Sarah Page declined to press any charges. Tuesday, May 31st. Now, there was still an investigation of what was going on uh, with the previous day's incident and uh, Dick Rowland was detained in the morning and held in Tulsa's jail. The ongoing police investigation was quickly reaching the conclusion that nothing had happened. Uh, the Tulsa Tribune ran an article in that day's afternoon edition, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator, and that hit the streets around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and word of a lynching started to spread around town. Uh, for our European listeners, uh, a lynching is an extrajudicial killing of a person by mob violence. Uh, frequently they just nab him out of police custody and murder him in a field. The new sheriff, Willard M. McCullough, decided to move Roland into the more secure Tulsa courthouse, where he was held in a cell on the top floor. Meanwhile, the whites of Tulsa were busying themselves with forming a lynch mob. McCullough prepared the courthouse for an assault, disabling the elevator, positioning deputies to guard the entrance and the stairwells, and placing six men armed with rifles on the roof of the courthouse. By 7.34 p.m., several hundred men had surrounded the courthouse, demanding that Roland be turned over to them. Sheriff McCullough refused and tried to talk the mob into going home, uh, to no avail. Now, a whole bunch of these folks had been organized by the Ku Klux Klan, of course, and included among the mob was Tulsa's founder and a Klansman, Wyatt Tate Brady, as well as other prominent members of Tulsa's white business community. Meanwhile, the folks back in Greenwood were determining how to prevent the lynching from occurring. Lynching was fresh in the memory of everyone in Tulsa. The previous year, Roy Belton, an 18-year-old white man, was forcibly taken from the county jail and lynched in a field nine miles out of town. O.W. Gurley himself went to the courthouse to talk with the sheriff, who assured him there would be no lynching tonight. Many younger members of the Greenwood community, mostly World War I veterans, decided that more direct action was needed. About 30 of them took up arms and drove down to the courthouse to offer their assistance to the sheriff. Now, McCullough also managed to convince them that there would be no lynching that night, and they went home. However, we've seen this time and time again. The one thing which spooks white people like no other is armed black people. Hey, remember that time the NRA vigorously defended the Black Panthers when they occupied the California state capitol? Oh wait, they turned around and supported the Mulford Act, which was specifically designed to disarm the Black Panthers. Hey, remember that time the NRA fought for justice when legal gun owner Philando Castile was shot by a police officer for simply stating that he had a legal concealed firearm? Oh wait, they issued a vague statement which basically said he deserved it since he used the devil's lettuce. That's because the NRA, especially since the Cincinnati Revolt of 1977, where radical right-wing members ousted the previous moderate leadership, 
uh, has been an organization that solely represents the interests of gun manufacturers and stokes fears of race wars and heavy-handed gun control to promote sales of firearms and ammunition to scared rich white people. Here are other gun clubs you can join that aren't run by insane people and or Iran-Contra veterans. Okay, back to the subject at hand. So, members of the would-be lynch mob, now over 1,000 strong and convinced that a black uprising was about to occur, returned home to collect their rifles and ammunition. Another contingent, about 300 to 400 men, attempted to raid the National Guard Armory for its small arms and ammunition. A Major James Bell of the 180th Infantry managed to get guardsmen to report to the armory before the mob arrived. He told the mob he'd shoot them if they tried to come in. The mob went away. Now over the next few hours, the mob at the courthouse continued to grow, and many more of its members were armed. Meanwhile, Greenwood residents circled the blocks around the courthouse in cars to keep tabs on the angry mob and do some reconnaissance, you know. Uh, around 10 p.m., another contingent of 80 armed Greenwood residents arrived at the courthouse to offer their assistance to the sheriff, who once again declined the help. However, according to eyewitness accounts, one of the members of the lynch mob demanded that one of the Greenwood residents surrender his pistol. This resulted in the first exchange of gunfire of the night. It lasted only seconds, but ten whites and two blacks were dead at the end of it. Uh, the Greenwood residents uh, fled the scene, and the mob pursued right back to Greenwood. Wednesday, June 1st. Chaos and pandemonium reigned through the night. The white mob began firing indiscriminately at any black people they saw. They looted businesses and set them on fire. The fire department was turned away at gunpoint by the white mob. Black residents take up arms to defend their community and return fire, but they simply don't have the numbers to repel the thousand-strong mob. By 1 a.m., Archer Street was in flames. Fighting was most intense near the Frisco Railroad tracks. Passengers on a late-night train were actually forced to duck when it was caught in the crossfire as it was arriving in Tulsa. At 5 a.m., the second assault on Greenwood began. Crowds of rioters poured into Greenwood amid volleys of gunfire by black residents. They were led by a car with five white folks in it. Uh, Greenwood residents shot them dead before they made it a block into the neighborhood. However, the white rioters far outnumbered the black residents, many of whom had fled over the night. Uh, rioters indiscriminately killed any black people they saw. They looted and set aflame houses and businesses and they conducted brutal executions and assaults. Now, soon after this, the first planes arrived. Uh, Two-seater biplanes left over from World War I flew low over Greenwood, and the pilots dropped balls of flame and turpentine on homes and businesses and fired on residents. This was the first aerial bombing on U.S. soil. And uh, black people in other parts of Tulsa were affected as well. Mobs demanded that white families who employed black live-in servants or cooks hand them over to be sent to detention centers. Most white families complied with the uh, mob's demands. Uh, those that didn't were physically attacked and had their homes vandalized. Now, the National Guard had arrived early that morning but refused to act until all the necessary legal arrangements had been made, and the declaration of martial law did not come until 11.49 a.m. Violence was suppressed very quickly by the National Guard, primarily by means of detaining black residents and relocating them to detention centers. The National Guard was fired upon by both blacks and whites, but only blacks were detained. Now, the 2001 Oklahoma Commission to investigate the riots placed the death toll at between 100 and 300 people, which is, you know, a pretty wide margin of error. Uh, many more were wounded, and both black hospitals had been burned in the rioting. The white hospitals did not make accommodations. So, in the end, Dick Rowland did not get lynched, and he was released. 
uh, no whites were prosecuted for their involvement in the riot. Greenwood was a smoldering ruin. The community had either dispersed or been murdered. Homes and businesses were destroyed. Lives had been ruined. And there was hardly anything left of the once prosperous neighborhood. An all-white grand jury was impaneled to conduct a brief investigation of the riot, and they placed the blame squarely on the residents of Greenwood. But a talk of rebuilding began almost immediately. Residents erected tents while the city and business leaders determined what to do. White developers insisted that the city's fire code be amended to prevent wooden dwellings from being erected ostensibly to prevent fires. Uh, in effect, this prevented the rapid rebuilding of Greenwood, since brick structures took longer to construct and cost more. Uh, even temporary wooden dwellings were prohibited. Many residents spent the winter of 1921 to 1922 in tents. Uh, the city fathers also attempted to rezone what was derisively known as the burned area, for industrial use and to use some of the land for a new Union Depot. Uh, Union Depot was eventually built just west of Greenwood and more industrial uses found their way into the neighborhood but it began a slow recovery. But uh, ironically desegregation largely ended this recovery with all businesses now open to all customers shopping in downtown Tulsa or its new suburbs became more attractive. Residents began moving out of Greenwood to the suburbs or other areas of the city and the wealth left with them. Uh, again, not advocating for segregation, uh, just saying what happened. The next blow to Greenwood came with the construction of Interstate 244 straight through the heart of the neighborhood in 1975. Uh, this highway, which destroyed much of what was left of the richest and most prosperous black neighborhood in the country, was named after Martin Luther King Jr. in 1984. So today, very, very little of Greenwood is left. After the commission released its 2001 report on the riots, it recommended economic reparations to Greenwood residents. These reparations were eventually uh, determined to come in the form of economic development in the neighborhood, or in less coded terms, a handout to developers and institutions. Uh, so this economic development took the form of a minor league baseball stadium at Archer Street and Greenwood Avenue, and a new campus for Oklahoma State University, taking up huge amounts of land where a bustling commercial street uh, once stood. Those vestiges of the neighborhood that remain can be counted on one hand. There's a block of buildings on Greenwood Avenue. There's the Mount Zion Baptist Church. There's the Vernon Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. There's the Greenwood Cultural Center, which is a single house from Old Greenwood. And there are a few scattered buildings. A few plaques commemorate the location of businesses on Black Wall Street, but plaques are a weak substitute for the vibrant and thriving neighborhood which is gone and by all accounts will probably never return. So what's the takeaway on this? Uh, like all young socialists, my knee-jerk reaction to literally anything I see is class reductionism. But the destruction of Greenwood doesn't fit neatly into any narrative that's exclusively class conflict based. Unless you go full lefty, Paul, and say that Greenwood deserved it because it was full of class traitors. That's obviously a pretty bad analysis. So, Stephen Grant, who is some kind of capitalist with the blue check mark, had a pretty gross tweet recently that went viral, and I think it's relevant. Greenwood was probably the greatest example of black capitalism that has existed in the past hundred years. He was brutally suppressed. Why? So the, the capitalist system does not protect all the wealthy equally all of the time. During times of crisis, uh, capitalism seeks to protect itself by reinforcing oppressive systems of racism and discrimination, uh, often through fascism and its good friend ethnic cleansing. 
uh, those few wealthy people belonging to the targeted populations can and will be thrown into the meat grinder if it is necessary to maintain the stability of the system. Malcolm X said, uh, you can't have capitalism without racism. Capitalism is a system which requires exploitation and oppression to function, and it needs racism to keep the exploited from recognizing and doing something about their exploitation. One of those methods of oppression was segregation. Keeping poor blacks and poor whites away from one another prevents any kind of shared class consciousness from developing. It also created a permanent exploitable underclass who could be arrested or straight up lynched for any perceived slight against white people or the upper classes. Greenwood was an anomaly. Through complicated happenstance and a weird economic situation, it was bizarrely able to financially benefit from segregation. Uh, whites feared what wealthy blacks were capable of, as was evident by the belief of the angry white mob that they were quelling a black uprising attempting to take over Tulsa, rather than burning houses and shooting women and children. I think the second lesson here is the importance of community self-defense. I'm sure a bunch of folks' reaction to the story will be something like, well, if Greenwood hadn't sent over armed people to the courthouse, the riot wouldn't have happened. And, oh, okay, maybe it wouldn't have, but maybe then Dick Rowland would have gotten lynched. Maybe the angry mob would have made a stop in Greenwood on the way home from the lynching anyway. Maybe there would have been even less time to organize community defense efforts, and the conflict would have turned out even worse than the events that actually transpired, you know, if that's even possible. It's all maybe, maybe, maybe. All we can say for certain is that the only folks who could help Greenwood were the people who lived in Greenwood, and they put up an admirable fight in the face of overwhelming odds. I mean, what else were they going to do? Are they going to deliver a petition to the angry racist mob? Do an inspiring speech to disperse the angry racist mob? No, you send an organized contingent of armed people to the courthouse. While ostensibly this was to offer aid to the police in protecting Dick Rowland, it also says something else. It says, hey racist mob, if you lynch this guy, you're going to have some problems. Now, unfortunately, Greenwood lost this conflict and lost pretty big time due to the sheer number of racists that managed to get themselves organized in such a short period of time, if indeed they actually organized in such a short period of time. I mean, apparently they just happened to have planes and turpentine bombs already waiting. And sure, maybe the conflict was provoked by the arrival of armed men from Greenwood, but what sparked a conflict, I think, at the end of the day was irrelevant. This conflict was very long in the making. Greenwood was an anomaly the system could not abide. A well-off, even wealthy black community uh, existing under a system which required segregation and oppression to function. It had to be destroyed to maintain the existing exploitive, racist, and oppressive order. In this case, active enforcement of the racist system fell on the rioters and the Klansmen who organized them, while the state's enforcement apparatus sat back and watched until they felt a sufficient amount of damage had been inflicted, then swiftly restored order by arresting the victims. So uh, there's a time for words, argument, peaceful protest, nonviolent civil disobedience, and so on, but the assault on Greenwood was not one of those times. The Klan, or whatever fascist group, cannot be reasoned with, and the state will not help you. Sometimes you gotta physically fight back. And a uh, third takeaway I want to throw in here, the riots of 1921 did not permanently destroy Greenwood. Greenwood rebuilt. The community continued to become wealthier, actually, and didn't peak until the 1940s. Uh, obstacles to rebuilding existed in 1921, including deliberate, racially motivated obstacles, but they turned out to be not as significant as those to come, namely the construction of Interstate 244 and the construction of the Tulsa campus of Oklahoma State University, which, between those two, wiped out the majority of land which constituted the neighborhood. 
and, unlike the riots, made that land unusable for housing or business. There was a street grid where this campus stands, with houses and businesses, until the 1980s. So, communities can and will rebuild, but you need to give them the opportunity to do so, and not give all the community's resources away for the sake of bogus economic development schemes. Okay, so that was the episode. Here's the commercial at the end of the episode. This was the bonus episode, where I'm putting out an episode once a month that covers the very specific real-life events in urban history. Uh, that's going to be available on my Patreon at the $1 level. Some of the stuff we might cover is stuff like Red Vienna, or the Lower Manhattan Expressway, or really whatever the Patreon suggests. I'm taking a lot of suggestions from them. So these videos are just going to be unlisted YouTube videos. So if you don't have a dollar, ask someone who does, ha uh, does contribute the dollar to give you the link so you can pirate the episode. But if you do have a dollar, please consider giving that dollar to me if you like the episode and want more of them. Uh, there are a few links in the description if you want to find out more about Greenwood, including a really detailed timeline of the events in 1921 by someone at University of Tulsa. It has pretty much every event in order from every account. Obviously, this means some accounts conflict with others, and it certainly conflicts with my account, but I, I didn't find it until after I finished the episode, so I didn't, I didn't base it too heavily on that particular timeline. Uh, you can follow me on the Twitter at do not eat one and you can follow me on Mastodon That's like the prehistoric elephant thing not the place Alexander the Great was from at do not eat at Mastodon dot social uh, See you all in the next episode